Hello and welcome back to another episode of Framing the Hammer, the podcast produced by 4A Arts, the American Alliance of Artists and Audiences, where we are seeking to change the narrative around arts and culture. And with our podcast, we like to explore all elements of arts and culture and how it enriches and informs and educates our American identity. I am your host, Gavin Lodge, also the executive director of 4A Arts, and I am joined by my new friend, Troy Plummer. Thank you for joining us, Troy. Well, Gavin, thank you for having me. It's a real delight to be able to chat with you again and be able to chat about a topic that's of such great interest, at least maybe just the two of us, but oh, at least it's oh. of great interest. So be it. If it brings us together to chat about it, that's all. I'm perfectly <laughs> fine with that. And uh, yeah. Troy uh, was introduced to me by a colleague, and he contributed a blog to our website a couple of months ago. And it was so fascinating. I thought, I'm sure there's a lot more to mine here. If nothing else, then I would love to hear Troy and his excitement talking about the topic of uh, how uh, America helped dig itself out of the Depression through the formation of the W. WPA. It goes it goes both ways because it yeah. starts out as the Work Progress Administration, and then within a few years it becomes the Works Project Administration. And I'm sorry, I think I put an S on the end of work, but it's the Work <laughs> Project Administration. And that's what you've just illustrated is a perfect example about the whole thing with the WPA and the New Deal. Uh, they didn't know it at the time, but they were definitely practicing what we know of as move fast and break things. They, yeah. That's what they were doing because of the exigencies of the situation. So they were so desperate for anything. And luckily they thought creatively and out of the box in ways that Washington isn't necessarily known for doing these days, but (laughs) thank you for, thank you for stepping in there and and helping even, I, I, I'm, I'm pretty well versed in the topic and yet it did uh, stop me because I would actually say that this is a topic that we is not explored nearly enough for all of the, um, the fantastic positive fallout and the consequences leading to um, American society and culture in uh, after in the 1940s, the 1950s, 1960s, it's really left a legacy. So Mm -hmm. before we I, before I even give you a chance to say yes or no to that, I would love to hear just briefly, um, tell us about yourself, where you are and what you do for fun and what you do for, well, work. It's the the Ford technique, I think, right? Uh, family, <laughs> occupation, recreation, and dreams. There you uh, go. You can even start with the dreams too. That's the, that's the most interesting part, probably. Well, it's uh, yeah. Being be, getting a chance to talk about this sort of stuff is is pretty much in my dream wheelhouse. So that's that's a good start. Uh, let's see, family wise. Well, I am fifth of six generations to farm. Uh, on my family's farm that's uh, up near uh, Seymour, Indiana. And if anybody's seen any John Mellencamp videos from the 1980s, especially small town, uh, you have toured my hometown. I have scooped the loop, so to speak, which is the business of driving around on a Friday and Saturday night, uh, just cruising. So American graffiti was, uh, was, uh, I, I lived the life. I went to Indiana University at Bloomington uh, as fate would have it, I was realizing today that one of my, my main mentor, uh, I was fortunate enough to have as Herman Wells, Herman B. Wells, who is the, the president, youngest still to this day, the youngest person ever to be president of a, a major university in the United States at the age of, I think he was maybe just in his thirties. Oh, I want to say at the time, he, what am I doing he with became, my life? <laughs> <laughs> he went on to become chancellor, but he worked, he actually, campaigned with FDR, um, uh, went with him when he was in the state of Indiana, uh, was a, a bite in the wool new dealer. Uh, so I, I, uh, oh, and I should add that Dr. Wells went on to head up, uh, the, uh, group that was responsible for rebuilding the education system in the former Nazi Germany under president Truman's direction. So it was wow. a real education. Uh, so I've, I've been around Roosevelt and, and the new deal for, for quite a while. Um, Mm -hmm. So I went to IU uh, and that's where I got my uh, progressive uh, bona fides. (laughs) I got got dyed in the wool there. You know, uh, in terms of art and WPA art, uh, IU is surrounded by it. My first class was in Woodburn Hall because I was a political science student and there are Thomas Hart Benton uh, murals that line the walls in Woodburn Hall, also in the IU Auditorium, which is just up the street from Woodburn Hall, and just massive, massive paintings, uh, and uh, was just really taken in by them because you know I, I I was the first in my family to go to college, 
Mm. And so all this was very new. I didn't really have any frame of reference, parents or, or aunts or uncles that could kind of tell me what it was all about. And one of the most striking things about it was you could see the KKK were painted into the murals because the one in Woodburn Hall was, was on Indiana history. And about every five years, because it's with every new incoming freshman class, there is a great hue and cry uh, about, you know, this somehow possibly promoting this sort of thing. Um, and then the university gets to have this conversation about it, about how, no, um, this is what real history is. If, if you're looking at history, and this is an old adage, right? I'm not the first to say it. And you're comfortable all the time. You're probably not doing history. Oh, or at least that. not doing good, good history. Uh, and so they, those things were a real education, like, oh, we're going to talk about it warts and all, right? Uh, mm -hmm. cause it was all on the wall. Uh, KKK burning a cross, manufacturing, agriculture, the good, the bad, and the ugly. It was all there. Mm -hmm. So that was my, that was actually my first introduction to WPA, this topic we're going to be talking about today, WPA mm -hmm. art. Uh, now I work for the University of Louisville in the IT department of the main library, which is the Ekstrom Library, and what's called the Office of Library Technology. So, uh, <laughs> and now I'm pursuing a degree uh, in history, a master's degree in history through the University of Louisville. And I'm very fortunate because it's part of my compensation package that uh, my tuition is paid for. Uh, That's so fantastic. that seemed like, yeah, it seems silly to leave it laying on the table. But those <laughs> are the broad strokes of who I am. What is a, a an artwork, um, art piece, art experience that you've had recently that was inspiring to you of any genre, any form, any medium? Um, well, there are, there are a couple. I, I was in addition. I, it's weird that I was so surrounded by art. So, I, in addition to the Thomas Hart Benton thing, the murals that I mentioned being exposed to at IU. I lived in singles dormitories because it just wasn't, I thought, I'm going to really focus, right? So everybody had their own room. I was so fortunate that right across the hallway was a young man who has since become a very close friend, uh, had then, we've been friends since that time, since 1980, 80, 81, something like that. James Huntley, H-U-N-T-L-E-Y. And James Huntley, if I can reach this now, went on to become a fine artist. Nice. This is, this is one of James' pieces of work. It's very evocative of the WPA. It's very evocative of where he and I grew up. He's also a, a native Hoosier. Uh -huh. um, and so, you know, we, we started talking, and I just remember being very taken because my, my initial arc was to go to the law school, right? Here was this very German uh, uh, farm kid, you know, Mr. Practicality. And right across the hallway was, was this guy who was so presumptuous, he thought he was going to make a living as an artist. <laughs> it was an outrage. How could that be done, you know? And so James kind of introduced me to a lot of his work, and, and that got me started in a lot of ways. But recently, uh, oh, I should say both he and his wife, Maria, are mixed media artists. Um, if you look them up, James Huntley or Maria Huntley, H-U-N-T-L-E-Y, on Google, you can see their work if anybody's interested. So there's, there's we a will, friendly plug for... We will, yeah, we will definitely... Artists, we all take, need to do what we can to promote the arts. Can you tell us about Federal One? Let's just go right to the sure. crux of it all. Tell us about Federal One and um, how you came to know about it. And I'm also dying to know, do we know who wrote it? But give us the background on Federal One. Sure. Well... Let me kind of lay the groundwork here. You know, uh, again, like we were talking about, and I don't, I don't know who, who said this. I know, um, uh, Obama's administration took some grief for making this observation any number of years ago when they were handed the crisis of the economic breakdown that was occurring at the end of, of the Bush administration. But the phrase was never waste a good crisis. Uh, and, and that's the mode we were in, right? Like, uh, I think Roosevelt said, well, this is how it's going to work. And I know this is, this is upsetting and this is hard to understand and hard to wrap your head around, but we're going to try things. We're going to measure how they work or don't work. And if they're not working, we're going to try something else. That's a paraphrase, but that's the environment we're, we're going to find ourselves in. So my research today, and I should say, I should stop and say right now as a nascent Hist historical scholar. I am in no way, shape or form, you know, the, the, the sine qua non of, of, uh, professional work on this. Uh, what I would direct people to, 
uh, are a couple things. I tried to make some notes here because I wanted to, to pass this along. But a nice counterpoint to that is written by Ben Davis, uh, B-E-N-D-A-V-I-S, Ben Davis. And it's available online at artnet.com. And it's we'll an op-ed piece. It. Okay, great. It's an op-ed piece he wrote back in February 25th of 2021. <clears throat> My read on this is that there were so many ideas percolating at the same time that, and, and you had a, certainly what I think fairly has to be described as a product of the people and the time. Roosevelt is coming from a very silver spoon in the mouth FDR is, uh, upbringing. He's a very privileged person, right? He's educated at Groton. Uh, he's educated at Harvard. Um, so his, the things that would have defined the senses and sensibilities of his, and I think it's fair to use the word class, um, were such that they resonated with these ideas. Now, what's commonly said is that um, the artist, George Biddle, uh, in, who had been a classmate of FDRs at both Groton and, uh, and Harvard, had sent him a letter because he had been exposed, Biddle had, to uh, a fellow artist, had been commissioned by the federal government in Mexico to do large uh, landscape artwork in federal buildings. <clears throat> and Biddle had written to FDR and said, hey, this kind of seems like a good idea. What do you think? And uh, FDR uh, then kind of kicked that to his right-hand man, who is Harry Hopkins. And Harry Hopkins and Eleanor Roosevelt had become boon companions in this notion that the New Deal was an opportunity to do just that, a new deal for the American mm -hmm. people. And we're going we're gonna to cut across all manner of things. We're going to talk about labor. We're going to talk about art. We're going to talk about, um, uh, you know, uh, health care. All the things that we kind of now, you know, define centrally, the culture wars, as we now refer to them, really, uh, it, their start is even before this time, but they're really coming into the fore now because of the exigencies of World War II, who's getting ready to come up, and certainly the Great Depression. You know, this is, uh, FDR gets demonized, right? He's the poster boy for a lot of what happens now in terms of criticism and, and uh, attacks about these sorts of wasteful policies of the liberals and progressives and that type of thing. My response to that is usually, I think it has to be set into context, which is what I'm trying to do here. And that is that the people that, you know, you, you want to demonize FDR, but he was so popular among the folks that those making those criticisms still characterize as the greatest generation, you know, a generation that had survived the what we call the Spanish flu even though it probably got started in the United States. That's another totally. history question. Um, <laughs> yeah. they, they had survived the Great Depression, and they were getting ready to go into, and under Roosevelt's leadership, would go on to be victorious in World War II. Before we demonize, before those folks de want to demonize FDR and the New Deal and those kinds of policies, the kinds of things we're talking about that are going to give rise and root to this notion of the importance of art in defining human existence and especially American existence at this time, he was so popular, those people elected him four times. But we have nothing to fear, but fear itself is what Roosevelt said. And in no small part, the arts were used to mitigate, to attack, to defend against those fears. And that's mm -hmm. very important, I think, for for all of us to keep in mind. So that's kind of that's kind of where it gets started, loosely speaking. There, you ha we all have to remember there are hundreds and thousands of people involved in making individual decisions on administrative levels. But the broad strokes are we could use art as, and I think you used this phrase when we were getting prepared, as positive propaganda. And I mean that positively in the same way that one would look at um, a religious tract or a hymn or a song that they love when they're feeling low. Those are the kinds of things we're talking about when we're talking about positive propaganda. It's not, not big lies uh, and not things that kick down instead of punch up. Those are responsible most directly for this push and emphasis on the arts being something so critical to helping America through the, the 
the horrors of the Great Depression and then going into World War II are first and foremost Franklin Delano Roosevelt and Eleanor Roosevelt, his wife, first lady. That gets passed then to Harry Hopkins, who's uh, Roosevelt's right-hand man. Uh, and then uh, on down from there, uh, in terms of, of heading up um, the FAP, uh, the Federal Arts Project, uh, which is, again, another subset uh, of the Works Project administration, that's the thing one always has to keep in mind here, um, is Holger Cahill. He headed up that program, and that was the one that was primarily responsible for the kind of works we think of as having emerged from the New Deal. Uh, he headed that up from 1935 uh, to 1943. So... Um, yeah, those are the those are the, the the primary players, and then all the yeah. folks that help them administer those ideas. But interestingly enough, to this point, you know the the funding that comes through uh, for this is part of uh, an initial four point eight eight billion with a B dollars, and again we're talking about the nineteen thirty, so no small chunk of change uh, that's approved under the Emergency Relief Appropriation Act, of which. $27 million goes to the WPA Federal Project One, which is commonly called Project One, as we've kind of been referring to it here. Those are synonymous terms, specifically for the creation of art. So um, it's, it's done, my understanding of it is it's done in such a hot house of need in the moment because of the Great Depression that a lot of these senators, even those that would be kind of questioning things, you know, what Roosevelt offers in a moment is clarity, right? Like his, as the president, is a single voice. And so he has a real power to concentrate uh, and to bring together on a single notion in a way that Congress does not, because it's just not set up to do that. Nothing against Congress people of the time. They just didn't have the same as Teddy Roosevelt, his cousin, uh, FDR's cousin would have said, the bully pulpit. They don't have it. He does. And so, and, and I think probably in a lot of ways, and you see this in accounts, they're very relieved. They're, they're relieved that somebody is going to put their hand on the tiller and take responsibility. And so, you know, again, we're talking about $4.88 billion at the end of the 1930s that's approved for the Works Project Administration uh, overall. And of that, tw two point, I'm sorry, yeah, no, $27 million for arts. It would have just been unheard of. And I yeah. doubt if, it, unless it had been the exigency of, of the depression, that people would have been, that they would have been able to get it through. Because that's the thing you usually see now, right? That's the thing that characterizes a lot of these debates and discussions now is that, well, it's fippery. We don't need this. It's, it's, it's window dressing. Yeah. We, we need right. to be concerned about coal mining and we need to be concerned about agriculture and we need to be concerned about building highways and bridges. All important things. Mm -hmm. All important things. But they were able to make the argument. So it's a two-part thing, in my opinion. They're able to make the argument of its importance because it's going to be the thing that motivates people, that keeps us focused, that helps to ameliorate some of the darkest days of the Great Depression. But let's be honest. They're also getting it through because things are go going crazy yeah. throughout the country because of the Depression. And when you're talking about a budget of $4.88 billion, and within that $27 million, they're not going to sweat that too much. $27 million <laughs> gets, tends to get lost in $4.8 billion. Do you feel like it was um, purely pragmatic to put people to work, or was there an element of, oh, in the meantime, we can literally just create art, and how fantastic <clears throat> is that? Or were they like, oh, that'll be a nice byproduct, but really we're just trying to pay people to keep them from starving? Well, there's a, the history that is on it, you could almost interpret it in any number of ways, except one that would emphasize that it was clearly one of those two options you've set up or the other. It's some mixture of the two, and people can differ as to how much they think it's 50-50, 75-25, 60-40, how they think it breaks down. That's kind of open to interpretation. But it's mm -hmm. very, like, for instance, there's a wonderful adage of Harry Hopkins, uh, uh, again, Roosevelt's right-hand man and, and close companion to a uh, friend of Eleanor Roosevelt, uh, who was put in charge of, of the WPA and, and, and then subsequently the arts aspects to it as well, who, 
who when asked by the media, because that becomes the pressing question, like what, $27 million for artists, what the hell, uh, was his quote is, to paraphrase, hell, those people got to eat too. <laughs> so that's certainly part of it. But I think they recognized that there was a very positive attribute to be had from it because we've also, let's not forget, as part of this, got uh, indexing programs going on. So there are people who are doing written histories of things at the same time that arts being the, the more kind of traditional fine arts that we think about in the form of stage productions, in the form of paintings, in the form of sculpture, uh, in the form of music that's being written. Um, and so, you know, there... I think in typically good political fashion, they're recognizing all the ways that they can get uh, the phrase I think that gets used is you got to use all the buffalo, right? <laughs> got to use all the buffalo, got to use the hide, got to use the meat, got to use the horns, got to use the hooves, got to use the tail. So they're going to get as much mileage out of this as they can. Look, this is a way for us to not keep, not have our heads down. Art causes us to aspire, to look forward to look up. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. This is a way of mitigating that fear. Uh, and at the same time, making sure that we don't have our best and brightest uh, dying in the streets or living in cardboard boxes because we simply can't, you know, get a hot meal to them. So yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely it, both. It had never occurred to me to make the, the, such a strong link between the idea of the WPA and federal one and uh, FDR's quote about only having to fear fear, that this really does mm -hmm. give, this is the way you inspire hope. This is the way you inspire people to look up, look forward. Times are horrible, but let's inspire people with hopefully art and hope so that they dream bigger. And uh, and that, yeah. that helps people dig out of their holes. This is, uh, I had never made, We're that's a deep psychological connection um, and well-crafted and e exploited in a good sense by uh, the yeah. new dealers. Yeah, I, I think you're absolutely right. It, look, it's the same way. There's common cause between a lot of people that would be on the religious right today and artists, even though that they tend to kind of be in warring camps at times. And that is asking ourselves, what does it mean to be more fully human? Mm-hmm. Right. People, people from a religious background, and I myself come from a very religious background, would point to the sense of fellowship, the sense of community, um, the uh, transcendent nature of being in the moment of a hymn, of a homily sermon, uh, of being in those spaces. And so too would artists. Art, we have that same, that same sense of awe, the same thing that caused me to get lost in the Van Gogh painting is very familiar, is a very familiar emotion to those who would identify as being particularly orthodox. And I think that's important to keep in mind because when things get really dark, when they get really hard, and this would have been true for people, especially in the administration, they see the numbers coming in. They know what things are actually looking like. They see apples being sold on the street corner and soup kitchen lines being set up and people living in cardboard boxes and folks from Oklahoma loading up all their possessions and trying to make their way west to California. They, they understand this. You have got to find a way. Military experts, they understand the same thing. I have got to figure out how to keep people motivated and morale high, not by lying to them, but by giving them something better to hope for. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what art is if it's not the, the attempt at trying to give something better for people to hope for. I bet you have a few favorite anecdotes about uh, artwork that was created during that time. Can you share a couple of those? So you get you get these really impassioned, heartfelt letters from artists to the Roosevelt administration saying two things, two two things in the main. One, thank you for not leaving us destitute. And two, we will rise to the gravity of this moment. And we recognize how important this is. This is an opportunity for us to say where we are as Americans right now, like you have paintings of, of, uh, of coal mines in New Mexico. You know, an artist wouldn't do that thinking that that was going to be particularly marketable in some way. Right. Nobody's going to hang that, you know, over their couch. 
right. um, or in a gallery someplace. But it captured the moment. It said who we were. The, these people were in the mines. They had jobs. They were bringing out coal so that people wouldn't freeze in the winter. There were those kinds of criticalities. So they recognized the gravity of the moment. And they also said, not only do we want to capture this in the moment, but we want to give people something to aspire to in the same way that I, as the artist, feel compelled in this moment to aspire to do my very best work. You see that time and again in the letters that the Roosevelt administration uh, received that they were cognizant of the gravity of the moment and that they really, really wanted to do the very best work that they could because they knew it would live on. When things come to an end for a lot of these federal projects, especially the arts projects, it is largely because two things. Um, they've had to deal with a lot of this, a lot of these attacks from the right because Let's be honest, what really is happening is the right's making hay among political hay among a great number of folks who are struggling with trying to understand a lot of what we've been talking about in terms of the complexities. They're not stupid. They just have other priorities. And when they're trying to keep uh, soup going on the stovetop and a roof over their heads, the idea that you're painting murals at Indiana University may not set too well with them. That's number one. Right. Number two is just the exigency of the war. Roosevelt mm. is now having to think about, as it's coming on, ramping up war production. He's having to keep a bunch of uh, business capitalists, and I don't say that with too much derision on my voice. He's got to keep those pe <laughs> He's got to keep those people happy so he can keep tanks produced, planes produced, small arms produced, ammunition produced, all the other things are going to be necessary for the war effort. And that's where his focus and the focus of the administration begins to shift. And art, unfortunately, is sort of one of those things that becomes an easy sacrificial goat because it kind of gets that argument off his back. Now, right. of course, we'll see that, we'll see the, the seeds of everything that we're talking about here today bear fruit later in the form of the National Art Institute. I mean, the help me out here, Gavin. The, 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 the most recent National, iteration. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah National exactly. Endowment National Endowment, Endowment for the Arts. These are all this. This is where all those get their start. This is yeah, really the seeds are planted. Back taking it seriously. Yes, but it's precisely. too bad. It does make sense. I mean, I was you anticipated my question, which was, so how did this all essentially come to an end? But right. we did have to fight the Nazis, and uh, it does. Yep. I'm sure there were plenty of ways to justify still employing artists, but an awful lot of those artists actually marched off to war too, and uh, precisely young people. And so I, I do understand. Well, we the, have that wonderful movie, needs. The Monuments Men, right? Yeah. We have that wonderful movie, The Monuments Men, right? All like, right? So not only are the young men going off, right? But, but folks are finding roles all over the place. And that's, I should, I should remember. Yeah. That's a, that's, that movie really makes our argument for us in a lot of ways <laughs> about how important this is, right? Like right. to erase or to eliminate or to degrade art is to eliminate, erase or degrade a culture. Oh. And that's, I think, really at the, the heart of what we're talking about. Art goes to the very heart of asking who are we, who are we and who do we want to be? And, and history is right, right in that mix with, with art. And it's, it's a, it's sort of art in a lot of ways for me as a budding historian is the canary in the mine shaft, right? It's the thing that's going to tip me off about what's coming. Because when you see art starting to be attacked, you know that there's a whole host of other stuff that's coming down the pike and it's not going to be good. But when you yeah. see art being promoted, you can also feel some sense of ascendancy. Now, again, we can have a conversation about people don't like Robert Maplethorpe's work or, you know, something they find particularly controversial. But in a lot of ways, that's what the point of art is. It's to prompt those kinds of conversations. But yes. to say they shouldn't happen at all is to just suffer a slow death, a death of a society. It no longer has vibrancy. They provoke uh, thoughts and they, they artists need to help us think deeper and think bigger. Kind of like what you said at the beginning at when you were talking about uh, your education at IU, where history is, when you're studying history, you shouldn't necessarily be comfortable. And art isn't always, sometimes, hey, there's, uh, there's definitely a place for just sheer escapist entertainment. I mean, Absolutely. I am a Broadway tap dancer. I, I embrace <laughs> that 100%. But also, right. um, also, it's not always just meant to be escapism and thinking about 
the yeah. good old days, which I definitely put in quotes. I'd like to good. close with an, a really amazing thing that you wrote on the in your article that um, I'm just going to reread it, which is art then is now is simultaneously meal and recipe, compass and map, sword and shield. We know this to be true on a level so deeply rooted in our individual and shared psyches that it is often lost in our subconscious, becoming the background to our lives in the form of the movies we enjoy, the concerts we attend, the books that act as the best of friends, and the fine arts that inspire us to see. As Abraham Lincoln's inaugural address would highlight, the very better angels of our natures. And I want to leave it there that you have brought to light um, a lot of the better angels of our natures, I think, in this these efforts. And let's hope that our elected leaders and our society can always remember um, what can serve to inspire and enlighten and improve our lives um, so that we are living more enjoyable lives because the pursuit of pleasure is really, really important in humanity. So. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you. Gavin, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Troy. Right. Appreciate it. Much appreciated. And um, uh, go go do some more research and come back and talk to us about this stuff. <laughs> I would I would love to do that. Thank you. I'll thank look you. forward to it.